nurse, we'd have to call a taxi. Hey over there, Joe Lunchbox. Enjoy nighting out. And today we have landed right here in Elmont, New York. Uh, we're actually at the Beth David Cemetery mm -hmm. here in Elmont, New York. We've come to pay our respects and share with you two famous graves. And right now we are approaching the first one and it's going to be Andy Kaufman. So if you want to come here and see it, we're actually standing on the corner of Autumn Avenue and Cardoza Avenue. But we're gonna tell you a little about Andy Kaufman, show you his grave, so if you wanna come along, step right up and let's go for this ride. Before you do that, it's weird doing it at a cemetery or something like that, filming. You know everything I want you to do, like, subscribe, share, comment, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just awkward saying it in general, it's more awkward saying it here. Please just do the things. <laughs> all right, well, let's go check out the graves. Like I was saying, we're farther into the cemetery on the corner of Autumn Avenue and Cardoza Avenue. Uh, if you did want to come, this is a Jewish cemetery, so do not come on a Saturday. And tuck away in between these bushes on this tree, we have the graves of Kaufman and Bernstein. And in the corner, we have the final resting spot of Andy Kaufman. And as we can see, Andy Kaufman was born January 17th, 1949. He grew up in the town of Great Neck, and he always wanted to perform. He started performing for family and friends by the age of seven. By the age of nine, he was actually being hired to do kids' parties. Now, after a year at Boston Junior College, he started um, doing stand-up. He never wanted to be known as a comedian. It just, I guess, was a way to get his foot in the door, and he was discovered by an improvisation comedy club owner, Bud Friedman. Now, his style of comedy was a little different than most people's style of comedy. As if any of you could go look him up online if you don't know who Andy Kaufman is and find him. Now one of the most things that made him was, so two things back in 1975 really got Andy Kaufman noticed. The first thing was on the premiere episode of Saturday Night Live, which back then was known as NBC Saturday Night the first episode hosted by George Collin, Andy Kaufman did a stand-up comedy bit where he was did his Mighty Mouse impersonation. And I guess they liked him because a few weeks later, November 8th, 1975, when Candace Bergen was hosting, he also did his foreign man routine on that one. And I love the acts where with the foreign man, it was such a straight act saying bad jokes but it was him just the way he presented it that was what made the performance and also that year in 1975 he was on a, a show hosted by Dick Van Dyke and of course he did the foreign man impersonation then too and from that he paused and went right into his Elvis impersonation and right back to the foreign man afterwards say thank you very much and because of these shows on like Saturday Night Live and that, he was this, not, I don't want to say discovered, he was already obviously discovered he was on Saturday Night Live. But um, they decided to put him on the TV show Taxi, which aired from 78 to 1983 as Laka Gravis. Now this character sort of took his foreign man that he did in stand-up and stuff like that and shaped it into being the character for Taxi. Now, like I said, Andy didn't consider himself really an actor. Well, he was an actor. But, um, how to say it, 
He wanted to be more of a performer. He would never say that he was a comedian. He would say he's more of a, a song and dance man, stuff like that. And it wasn't that he was always out there to get a laugh. His more important thing was to evoke an emotion. So his other projects, even if there was weird for some people, I think using Taxi to get the stardom, he was able to do some of these other amazing things that he did. And one of the things was like, he had another character named Tony Clifton. Tony Clifton was a lounge singer, Vegas style, like real crude type guy. Now, what was funny, funny with Tony Clifton, Andy always had his, I would say one of his good friends was a writer, Bob Zemedis with him. And everyone knew that Andy was portraying this guy, Tony Clifton. He had to be on taxi. They got him stand-up routines. But occasionally, Bob would actually end up doing this Tony Clifton character more than Andy. So they could actually be in the same place, which would make people confused because everyone knew Andy was doing this Tony Clifton character. So how are they in the same room? And I love stuff like that that really messes with people's minds and it's getting that reaction. And some of these routines where Andy wasn't even there and Bob would go do the stand-up routine or go do the specials. And people thought like they were getting Andy Kaufman as Tony Clifton, but no, they were getting Bob as Tony Clifton. And weird stuff like that is what I love. Like a personal story by Andy Kaufman is in early April of 1979, he actually got to perform at Carnegie Hall. And my father always say, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. I guess Andy Kaufman did it by evoking emotion in people. Now, this Carnegie Hall act, people didn't know what to expect. I, I mean, they might have thought they knew what to expect, but the good thing about Andy was he switched things up a lot. I, I like to say, like, if, if you thought you were getting the foreign men, sometimes he might be reading a book to you, or impersonations, or... Well, this time, he actually had his grandmother in a wheelchair that, in the middle of the show, stood up, has a heart attack, dies on the floor, and he does, uh, now would be culturally insensitive, Native American dance brings her back to life. The grandmother was actually played by Robin Williams. That's not how this is a personal story. So. After the show ended, Andy tells his whole audience that they're all going to be taken out for milk and cookies. So he puts them on, I think they said 35 buses, I don't know if that numbers are not right or not, and he took them to the cafeteria of the New York School of Printing. Now this is how it turns into a personal story. On my mom's side, my uncle and my pop-pop, who's my grandfather, they were both cleaners in the city schools and janitors, whatever you want to call them. And at that time, my papa was the cleaner at the New York School of Printing. That was the school that he spent most of his career at. And Andy brought all these people in to the school to have milk and cookies. They had little bags of famous Amos chocolate chip cookies. And my grandfather always would tell me the story of when Andy Kaufman brought these people in. But you would think that's the end of a bit. Like, but Andy wanted to make this a longer act. So. He actually stood up. This wasn't him and, and Bob didn't discuss this beforehand. He said, you know what? I'm gonna perform even more. Meet me on the Staten Island Ferry tomorrow. And we'll do this, take this act even farther. And a lot of people didn't know if he was serious or not. But Andy woke up and went, no, I'm, I'm doing this. And he went to Staten Island Ferry and some people did show up. And on the Staten Island Ferry, he did stuff like his Mighty Mouse impersonation. He uh, recited the song MacArthur Park and he wrestled a woman on the ferry, he even wrestled a woman named Deborah Croce. Uh, it was one of his bits he did, and that ties into another thing what I love about Andy Kaufman. Now you see, Andy Kaufman had different passions in life. Like I was saying, he wanted to evoke emotion in people. And he figured one way to do that is, why not be a professional wrestler? Must have loved professional wrestling, he had this great idea he was going to be, and he was, the inaugural, first ever in the world, intergender wrestling champion. Now, he would go to spots and offer $500 if a woman could beat him, wrestle women, say stuff like they belong in the kitchen and making babies, really getting that heel heat in wrestling. They started like that, but then all of a sudden, Championship Wrestling Alliance, also known as the, the, uh, the Memphis Territory, 
took notice of this and was like, hmm, you come do it here. He started doing it there, and it was up to $1,000. Russell Andy Kaufman, you get win the beat him with $1,000, the intergender champion. And he would have things like, he'll, if you beat him, you'll shave his head. If you beat him, he'll marry you. All these crazy stipulations. And with that, sometimes the women were valeted by Jerry the King Lawler. And the heat started coming and coming that, you know what? Jerry's going to defend these women honor. And, and Andy would wrestle women because he could beat women. And Jerry the King Lawler became the thing was like, well, Wolf will wrestle. So on April 5th, 1982, Andy Kaufman went against Jerry the King Lawler in Andy Kaufman prior, I would say, biggest match. And Andy actually won this match, but he didn't pin Jerry Lawler. Uh, back then, pile drivers weren't allowed, and when they were wrestling, he got Jerry Lawler so angry that, Andy, that Jerry Lawler pile drived him, pile drived him again, lost the match, and Andy went out on a stretcher. And like, they kept this bit going that four months later they appeared on Letterman and it's one of the most important things I feel in professional wrestling like you figure wrestling back then was an old school mentality uh, I don't use the F word that four letter F word that's bad I will say the results of professional wrestling are predetermined but that old school mentality not everyone knew they were predetermined so feuds people really thought were very very real so when they were on Letterman, some words were said, and Jerry Lola gets up and whacks Andy Kaufman, and I think Letterman, some coffee got thrown in, some words, were, like I said, were said. Letterman said something paraphrasing along the lines like, I don't know if you could say those words on TV, but you can't throw some coffee. And this was really the end of the wrestling bit, but it helped build professional wrestling. We figure, wrestling was big in, in, in Madison Square Garden, WWF, but the territories and worldwide, like, nation, how to say it, uh, like national people, the first time professional wrestling made its way to Main Street Media. It's funny, when he started wrestling, Andy, he wanted to wrestle for WWE, well, back then WWF, World Wrestling Federation, but he was friends with a wrestling magazine writer who said, no, 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 Vince McMahon wouldn't want a bit like that, which is funny now, seeing what... WWE does, I'm sure they would have loved a bit like that. And he ended up going to wrestle, like I said, in the Southern Territory at Memphis, Mid-South. I loved how much the character, like when he was fighting Jerry Lawler in that feud, when they were building up to it, he was showing up to towns, teaching Southerners how to bathe and take care of themselves. Really being that heel character, devoting this isn't comedy, this wasn't to get a laugh, but it's really getting that emotion. And that's the genius, is people started seeing these crazy, crazy things about Andy. That's why on December 11th, 1983, Andy Kaufman was diagnosed with large cell carcinoma lung cancer. And a lot of people thought this was a bit. It wasn't a bit. Uh, Andy got sick very quick, very fast. He tried chemo, he tried talking to medicine men, he even went to the Philippines, tried some surgery, which is just a magic trick where they pretend to pull the tumors out of you. Um, obviously, it didn't work, because on March 16th, 1984, Andy Kaufman passed away from this cancer, at the age of 35. And as we see, he's here with his family. Andy Kaufman, beloved brother and grandson, January 17th, 1949 to May 16th, 1984. We love you very much. Thank you very much. There are some people, there are crazy myths and rumors that Andy Kaufman actually isn't buried here at all. In fact, that he's not even dead. But the way I look at those myths and rumors is, it's interesting. Andy impersonated Elvis Presley. He was actually Elvis's favorite Elvis impersonator. But I feel like when Elvis passed away, people would cite Elvis all over the place. Elvis was seen here. Elvis was seen there. He became bigger than himself. The legend of the man himself sort of became bigger than the man himself. People didn't want to believe at only age 35 this 
genius performer passed away and I feel that those the myth that he still could be alive because how can a man 35 be dead peak careers just taking off massively and and there was always rumors that he might be alive faking it like this was the next bit but I personally don't believe that like I was saying I think just the legend of the man himself is bigger but his friend Bob used to always say that no no this is just this is just, just a bit and he's alive somewhere with that being said his friend Bob always says it's gonna happen 10 years 20 years and it never happened Andy never came back but there's a quote about that the longer it goes the more Andy Kaufman waits for his cue the deeper the joy when he returns to take his shy bow it would be amazing if next year the year after he comes out and it was just a thing It'd be one of the craziest things but you never know there's weirder things like someone leaving a shrimp on someone's grave instead of a stone at a Jewish cemetery but I don't know to me that doesn't seem kosher even after his death Andy Kaufman's legacy was preserved because other music wise and movie wise reflected back on his life like when you look at R.E.M.'s 1992 album Automatic for the People and the song on there Man on the Moon with lines like Hey Andy, are you goofing on Elvis? Hey baby, are you having fun? Like movies based on Andy's life. Like in 1999, they made the movie Man on the Moon starring Jim Carrey. And you see people that must have liked Andy so much that even people like Jerry Lawler came back to play Jerry Lawler in the movie with Jim Carrey. Wrestling Jim Carrey, pretending he's Andy Kaufman little weird fact about that is not about the movie but about Jim Carrey and Andy Kaufman is they both share the same birthday of January 17th obviously different years though so we are going to go see one more celebrity grave here at the Beth David Cemetery uh, this one is if you want to come we'll tell you when we get there who it is but after we tell you if you want to get here it is as far back as you could go on the right hand side right along the fence it's not on the fence, it's on the other side, but you'll see it if you're driving in the far right corner of that. So, and this person that we're gonna go see, like I was saying how Andy Kaufman was a performer that wrestled, but even if you, you wanna say he was a wrestler, it was his passion, so much so that um, if any of you know Jeff Jarrett, Jerry Jarrett was the founder of that wrestling company I talked about. And when Andy died, they found all the checks weren't cashed. He wasn't wrestling for the money. He was doing it for the reaction because he loved it so much. But that's that's besides the point. So where we're going, though, somehow in a weird way, with my love of wrestling, it ties into my love of wrestling and ties into Andy Kaufman. Never that their paths ever passed in the wrestling world, but I'll explain when we get there. So let's, let's go. Next grave we come to is actor Martin Landau, born June 20th, 1928 in Brooklyn, New York. Well, I see, you might be wondering, how does Martin Landau tie in to Andy Kaufman? Well, we'll get there. First, a little bit about Martin Landau. He was, grew up in Brooklyn, first real job was at 17. He started working for the Daily News where he ended up working his way up becoming a staff cartoonist and an illustrator. But he always had aspirations of being an actor. It was his major ambition in life. And he got his first role, stage role, on a show called Detective Story at Peak Island Playhouse. And that was in Peak Island, Maine. He didn't only want to be doing these little plays in Maine. He saw he did whatever he could do to get better roles. He was one of 2,000 applicants who auditioned to Lee Strasberg's acting studio in 1955, and only him and Steve McQueen were accepted, the only two people accepted. And besides meeting Steve McQueen, he also was friends with James Dean back then. And he would have a bunch of little parts until he made his big Broadway debut in the middle of the night in 1957. Now, his first motion picture happened two years later in 1959 in a movie called Pork Chop Hill. But some people feel his breakout role was actually a little later that year. He was actually in Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest. 
he played the heavy, the, the henchman type guy. And you actually see him fighting Cary Grant. He gets shot in the head, standing on top of Mount Rushmore when he's stepping on Cary Grant's fingers to try to make him fall. And like that, people say, might have been like his breakout thing. And people might remember him from shows like from back then. Like he was one of the, the main stars in the Mission Impossible show. His career grew and faded out a little, grew back. But what made him start getting stardom again later in life was in 1994, he was in Tim Burton's movie Ed Wood starring Johnny Depp. And Martin Landau played Bela Lugosi. And great movie. He actually won the Academy Award in that movie for Best Supporting Male Actor. Now, but you're like, Joe, you said he ties to Andy Kaufman. How does this work? Well, the reason I'm a big fan of Martin Landau is a movie that not that many people might be a fan of, but I love it so much. In later 90s, he was in a movie called Ready to Rumble. In case you're not familiar with the movie Ready to Rumble, it was where a bunch of WCW stars were in it, and the actor Oliver Platt played Jimmy King, and they fired from the company, took away his belt, and David Arquette, who was a real wrestling fan, his father wanted to be a cop like him, but no, David Arquette wanted to be a professional wrestler, which in real life he did become later. But he had to find Jimmy King and inspire him to go back to win back the championship. Now, Jimmy King, when he found him, was so out of shape. They needed to get Jimmy King back to be a real wrestler. So he figured the best way to do it is take him to an old school wrestling school. And Martin Landau played that wrestling coach. He was Sal Bandini. He'd always jump up and say, Sal Bandini, wanna wrestle? And I thought that was the funniest bit. I felt it stole the whole movie. I love the movie. And because Martin Landau playing Sal Bandini, he trained Jimmy King when Andy Kaufman in real life wrestled Jerry the King Lawler. I figured both of them had to do with a wrestler named King. And I just think it's a weird coincidence that they're both in the same cemetery here at Beth David Cemetery. But we wanted to come pay our respects to Martin Landau. Looks like he's buried with his mother, Selma Landau, and his father, Morris Landau. I like on his grave having the comedy and tragedy masks. Martin Landau, beloved father, grandfather, brother, actor, mentor, died July 15, 2017, age of 89 years. So we really appreciate you joining us today, mm -hmm. coming to visit the grave of Andy Kaufman and Martin Landau, two great actors. Oh, yeah. Andy Kaufman didn't want to be considered actor, didn't want to be considered comedian, but I'd say, say great performers. And... We're just very happy that we got to come see them, pay our respects, mm. pay respects to everyone, their family members here. So I think we could call it now. I think so. It's coming to Beth David Cemetery, visiting the graves of Andy Kaufman and Marn Landau. Been there, done that. Remember folks, safe travels. Good eats. And live life.